So check this out. Luxion, the makers of Keyshot, just released the follow-up to Keyshot 11. The new version is called Keyshot 2023. Four security updates, eight system updates, 34 feature improvements, and 121 bug fixes are what you're gonna find in Keyshot 2023. So if you wanna learn a little bit more about what some of these updates include, then this video is for you. Now I've been on the beta testing team for a little bit and I got to play around with this before it came out, but now that the software's finally been released publicly, I wanna open it up and share with you some of what I've found to be some noteworthy updates. Now this is not gonna be an in-depth tutorial on everything in here. I just really wanna show you what you have access to in Keyshot 2023. So without further ado, let's check it out. The first update I wanna point out is the refreshed user interface. Now it's not changed how you're gonna use Keyshot, just a little bit of how it looks. We do have an updated welcome window with a search menu or a search bar for recent scenes. Inside the new scenes tab, it looks like we have some scene templates. Templates are indeed a new feature of Keyshot 2023, and it looks like Luxion provided some templates to start with. Now, if you've watched one of my older videos about custom startup scenes, it's basically this, although my way of doing it was a bit of a hack or a workaround, and now it looks like they officially have templates, which we'll get into a little bit later. They also provide some demo scenes here for you to practice any of the existing features with or explore some of those. And they've got links out to learning resources, the website, quick tips, blog entry, manual, Keyshot forum. And I think this bar on the left is gonna go to Keyshot's website that covers all of the new items or changes in Keyshot 2023. So in addition to the updated welcome window, I'll hide that with W, the user interface has some higher contrast uh, icons. I imagine that helps a little bit with accessibility, people who don't see as well. But I will say after working in this for a while, the higher contrast UI elements can be a little bit of a strain on the eye, a little bit uh, fatigue inducing, if you understand what I mean. We also, let's go ahead and change my workspace to something uh, a little bit different. You'll notice that anywhere we have lists within our user interface, the background of those lists are quite a bit darker and then the text and icons are closer to white now instead of a light gray. We also have a lot of rounded edges, or I should say corners, in UI elements such as buttons. Like a lot of the buttons are rounded off. Not sure how I feel about that, to be honest. I do, I think Keyshot is, you know, a lot of the, the elements are still kind of squared off. So I think some of these rounded buttons kind of clash, to be honest, but um, it doesn't really change how the software works. It's just a personal preference item, I guess. The sliders, uh, I think do look a little bit better. I like how when you hover, the color turns to blue. It's got, I like how the line kind of shows, kind of changes from like black to gray. Um, I think these look a little bit nicer than they did before. And I think as far as this toolbar down at the bottom, we've got a web viewer option I think was added to. I think that's a new feature that sends your scene out to the Keyshot web viewer and I believe they might have reorganized or made some updates to how the tools are organized in here. But largely speaking, other than those items, the user interface is pretty much the same, mostly just kind of uh, the way it looks, if that makes sense, not so much how it's organized or functions. Next, let's go ahead and look at a feature called embedded profile correction. I'm gonna go ahead and add a cube, which is control one, and I'm gonna move and scale this cube into position a little bit. Maybe something like that, snap to ground. Okay, so we have a cube. Now I'm actually gonna go and apply a texture to the cube. So I've got a picture of my dog over here and I'll place him on the side here, looking pretty good. And this is just a plain old texture, an R RGB texture here. And you can see the texture name is Deckard, uh, RGB, blah, 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 JPEG, okay? Now what I wanna do is point out, we have this thing called use embedded color profile. This is now at the bottom of the color accordion. And if I turn this off and turn it on, you should not see any difference here. That is what I would expect because Keyshot by default typically looks at or assumes that your image textures are an sRGB color space, or I'm sorry, sRGB color profile. Um, now I'm going to turn this into a multi-material and we're going to duplicate the material and not link the texture. Now I wanna go ahead and edit the texture here and replace it with a different version of the same photo I have on my desktop. So I'll go ahead and browse and bring in 
the same image, but this time it's gonna be an Adobe RGB uh, color profile. And we should see that when we toggle between these two, we don't have any discernible difference. That's good. Now I'm gonna do this one more time. And in this case, I'm going to replace it with a texture that is uh, Apple RGB. And for the third time, we should see that they all look the same. Now let's go to the number two, the one that had the, uh, what is it, Adobe RGB, and turn off this use embedded color profile. Now if I toggle between the first one and the second one, you should see a bit of a shift in color, especially the black point. That's because some of these color profiles have different distributions of lights and darks. And in the past, if you were to use something other than an sRGB color profile image, Keyshot just automatically assumed that's what you were doing. Well, if you didn't know that or know how to change your color profile in a, in a program like Photoshop or something else, you might be wondering why there's a mismatch between, between what you see in Keyshot and then what you render out. Maybe you're using artwork or labels from an art department and you see a color shift. That has to do with this exact feature. Now, if we go on to our third option, which I think was Apple RGB, let me turn off use embedded color profile. This one, you see a major shift. And again, if we go and compare all these three, you'll see there's a shift between all of them now. But the good news is with this new uh, feature, use embedded color profile, as long as your image has the color profile embedded in it, Keyshot will now look at that and should compensate for it accordingly. And the net result is that you should not have a shift in colors that becomes problematic. What's cool is this is happening automatically under the hood, but at the same time, you can disable it if you need to. And the last thing I'll mention is if you're not very familiar with color profiles, this is not color spaces. So if you have something, a texture like, hopefully, hopefully I'm not misspeaking, but if you have a texture that's like linear R RGB or Rec 709, or if you have like CMYK or uh, anything else that's not a standard RGB color space, this isn't going to automatically change your color space. It's not performing color space transform. It's just doing a, it's looking for an embedded color profile and then it will correct it. So as far as I understand, let me see if this tooltip says otherwise, it does say color space. Well, anyway, um, as long as you're using an RGB texture, as far as I understand, and if there's a embedded color profile, Keyshot will interpret it correctly. So that's the first major benefit of this um, feature. It also has something to do with monitor color profiles. So if you're working on two, pro, uh, two monitors in Keyshot, this feature should look at the, I think, system-wide color profile, meaning if you're running Windows or Mac, it should look at the operating system color profile and adjust accordingly so that you don't have different looking uh, color profiles for your for each monitor. So I think that should help with color consistency as far as I'm aware. And then um, the final feature of this uh, or benefit of this feature is that Keyshot, when you go to render, render out your final image, it will actually embed the correct color profile to your rendering. So now when you open your rendering in another program like Photoshop or something else, it should contain the correct looking colors because by Keyshot attaching a color profile to your rendering, other applications should now understand how to interpret it and therefore you should not see a color shift as frequently as you do on older versions. So while this is not a big, sexy, exciting new feature that most people are gonna understand a lot about or care a lot about, it's going to improve the quality of life and the usability of the images you get out of Keyshot for sure. All right, let's quickly explore these templates. When you open the welcome window, which is the W key, we'll toggle that. Under new scene, we have three different templates and we can search for different templates. Now, if you followed along with one of my tutorials from, I don't know, about a year or so ago, uh, I'm pretty sure I had one that's all about startup studios where I basically made a large, medium and small startup studio. And then I showed you how to overwrite uh, your startup scene. So you could start off with the, the same um, startup studio every time. Looks like Luxion took some inspiration from that and implemented that in perhaps a little more user-friendly way, which is awesome. Here they have a large, medium, and small template. And basically it's a scene that has a placeholder object that you can 
uh, put a new model into and in that way you're kind of starting off with a good starting point. Let's go ahead and check these out. So when I click on the large one and hit create, so it looks like we have a bit of an environment here. Uh, I'll go ahead and hit D to turn off depth of field. Uh, let's see, my camera's locked, I think. So let's go to the free camera, turn off depth of field. If I zoom out, we can see we have this cool looking environment and we can just drop an object in and render it out. So that's kind of nifty. And the object here, I think is just a cube with some special materials, right? Yeah, so if we look in the material graph, they've got a bunch of nodes that and some labels and stuff to create these cool materials. That's interesting. And then in the scene, it looks like there's a model set called placeholder that I can toggle on and off and then like put a different uh, model or object inside here to render. If this is something you can make use of, that's very cool. It gives you something right out of the gate to use. But I think the whole purpose or point of templates is that if you work on a product that you're gonna render more than once and you want to start up with the same cameras, the same lighting every time, that's where I think these templates are really gonna come in handy. I don't think, uh, well, this is interesting. Um, I don't know where this texture is. It's not on my computer, so I'm gonna hit remove resources. But yeah, I think more so than the intention of, like I don't think Luxion expects you necessarily to use these templates for your own projects as much as this is giving you an idea of how templates can be used. And again, I, I'm thinking back to like products or companies that have um, products that they wanna render in a studio environment. Maybe you always want the same backdrop or the same cameras or the same lighting uh, because you can't export cameras from Keyshot. That's another big request I hear a lot, but you wouldn't need to if you were to save a template with your standard camera views and then always use that as a starting point or tell other team members to use that as a starting point. I think that's where these are really gonna come in handy. So that's quite cool. Let's check out the other one, the small one. So it looks like this one's just a, let's see, just a cube on a bit of fabric, which is kind of cool. I'm guessing this is real cloth maybe. Uh, nope, interesting. This, oh, okay. Um, what is this? Plain duck egg velvet. Yeah, I'm not sure what that is, but uh, anyway, you get the point. We have startup studios. Let's talk about another new feature called multi-layer EXR. Now multi-layer EXR is kind of like a layered Photoshop document, but it comes with a few benefits. It's much smaller in file size and it can be opened in a much greater range of software. So let's say I'm gonna render out this image and I want to render this out with multiple uh, layers or passes to edit in post-production. When I go to my rendering dialog and I go under output, I would change this to Photoshop document. And uh, okay, you'll see that under my layers and passes, I can include several layers or passes and I can combine them in a multi-layer file. That way, when I open this image in Photoshop, it's gonna come with an individual layer with each one of these passes. So we've had this for quite some time and it is handy, but what we haven't had is a multi-layered EXR option. EXR is a good image format because it contains lots of data. It's great for post-production. It uh, supports up to 32 bits per channel and it's fairly efficient as far as file size goes. The other big benefit is EXRs can be opened and a wide variety of visual effects softwares. Photoshop, however, is a uh, software specific uh, file format. It's proprietary, so this is primarily gonna be open in Photoshop, whereas EXR, you could render sequences out and then open those up as uh, animations in something like Premiere Pro or After Effects or DaVinci Resolve or whatever else you use for editing. So I personally like to use EXR formats and now we have the option to add render passes to a multi-layered EXR file. So I've gone ahead and rendered out a multi-layer EXR as well as a Photoshop document of the exact same scene. If I hover my mouse over the Photoshop document, you can see it's 221 megabytes. That is simply for a 1920 by 1080 image. Now it comes with a folder called render passes and you can see that it has all of our individual render passes and they look pretty good. Now, if I go ahead and take the multi-layer EXR and check out its file size, this one is only 27.3 megabytes, whereas the Photoshop document was 221. 
So the multi-layer EXR is about one-tenth the size. Now, I don't know if Keyshot's doing anything uh, crazy for compression. I don't know if the Photoshop document simply contains more data. This is something I need time to look into. But generally speaking, you're getting just as high quality of an image with the same editing flexibility as the Photoshop document uh, for a tenth of the size. Now, if I go to import this into Photoshop, you see this dialog pops up. This is a plugin called EXRIO, and it's free. And you are gonna need this installed if you're gonna open up an EXR in Photoshop. The good news is this gives you a bunch of options on how you want Photoshop to interpret some of these items. So maybe this is for a tutorial some other day, comment if that's important to you. I'll go ahead and open this up just so we can see and compare the options of the Photoshop document and the EXR. So here you can see we have our passes. We don't necessarily have them in a folder like we did with the Photoshop version. The other thing, um, I'm not sure if all these passes are the same. I'll have to look at that a little bit later, see if they rendered right. But the final thing I wanna point out is here in the Photoshop document at the bottom of my screen, if I hover over here, I can see the embedded color profile that Keyshot put into this file. It's sRGB, uh, what does it say? Of course it won't open now. It's sRGB IEC61966 2.1 linear RGB profile, 32 bits per channel. So that tells me that Keyshot embedded that color profile. Now, when I look at the EXR, it just says RGB built in 32. I don't think that means that Keyshot necessarily failed to write the color profile as much as I think that Photoshop may not be interpreting that correctly because Photoshop doesn't natively support open EXR image formats. Anyway, that's something to look into in the future. But the point is we now have multi-layer EXR out of Keyshot and it comes at a much smaller file size, which is great. And that file format can be opened in a much wider number of software. Now it will be interesting to see if Keyshot continues to develop this further and whether they add support for something like Cryptomat, which I know is uh, used a lot in various other software. Uh, it depends on how many people request that, I suppose. But I think having multi-layer EXR is at least a good step in the right direction when it comes to increasing Keyshot's compatibility with other software, or at least Keyshot's output with other software. Let's take a look at the physics simulation improvements. So Keyshot has provided this demo scene I've opened up, and it looks like we have much more complex objects in our scene that have been animated with a physics simulation. Now, if you're unaware of physics simulation, it's underneath tools and physics simulation. If you're on an older version of Keyshot, uh, I think before Keyshot 11, I don't think you'll have this tool. This is a fairly new thing that Keyshot added. And what it allows you to do is choose items in your scene and let them interact with one another. The way this is gonna differ from a lot of other software that does simulations is that these are basically collisions. So it will have hard bodies, things that don't deform, interacting with one another. And it has some basic gravity settings. And when you hit play, it's gonna drop the items in the scene and try to get them to settle. And depending on their shape and the size, that will, uh, Keyshot will determine their mass and it will try to simulate them as realistic as possible. Now there's a lot you can't do with this, so I don't want you to think this is a full on simulation tool, but for the use of Keyshot, this can be quite helpful for settling objects within a scene or demonstrating some simple movement. Now I'll admit, this is a pretty complex simulation to do in Keyshot. So this is probably on the more advanced end of what you could do with this tool but it's done it quite well. If I go ahead and hit play here, you can see these two wheels get dropped onto this ramp and they kind of settle back and forth. What makes this impressive and unique is that they also have something in the middle of them connected with these chains. And these chain links are interlinked and they're pulling back and forth. And to calculate this, this is actually doing some pretty decent physics, I guess. Whereas if you tried something like this in an older version of Keyshot, things that were overlapping like these chain links, as far as I experienced, they wouldn't work. Also things tended to explode, meaning if they were too close to one another at the start of the physics simulation, they would pop. And sometimes they wouldn't settle. They wouldn't come to, uh, they wouldn't stop moving. They would just kind of 
pop up and down like popcorn, I guess. So I'm gonna go ahead and hit okay there. And now we can see here, if I hit A on the keyboard, we have our simulation animation timeline. I'm just gonna drag my mouse across here. Watch what's happening. Let's actually see, yeah. So you see these little balls? We've got these emissive materials, I think, inside of a glass container. And even those are colliding with one another quite well as their container is moving and being jostled around. We also have all these chain links that when the wheel rotates, you can see the one at the bottom, they're all collapsing, and the ones up top have tension on them. So this is a pretty clever demonstration of physics simulation in Keyshot. Now you can't choose an object that's been simulated and then have other things interact with it yet, as far as I know. But again, this is a pretty major leap ahead from the previous version. And it's gonna take quite a bit of time and experimentation to see how far this can be pushed currently. Um, physics is a very complicated thing. And depending on what you're trying to achieve, some things may or may not work out. But this by far is an improvement um, upon what I saw in the previous version. So if you're interested in creating some more intricate or convincing physics simulations, then this may be another reason 2023 would appeal to you. All right, here we are in the material graph and I wanna show you a new feature. Well, a feature that's existed, but has been improved and that's the curve fade node. This is something that allows us to animate properties within a material. Now the curve fade has been around for a little bit, but its functionality got extended a bit when it comes to textures and what it can control. So if I were to take this curve fade node and connect it to an image-based texture, you see that we have options that we can control. We have width, height, shift U, shift V, angle UV, diameter, and depth. What's really cool is that, as far as I know, this curve fade node in the past would not control very many properties of an image-based texture. An image-based texture I pulled from my library, that means it's, it's like a picture. And when we look under our size and mapping, even though these are not shown as texturable properties, this curve fade node can now indeed control it. So if I click on width and I open the animation here, you can see the first value associated here is zero and the next one is one. Maybe we should unlink that real quick to take a look. It looks like under size, this is currently set to 1.3 feet. So if I go ahead and plug this into uh, width and take the curve fade from 1.3, and then let's go ahead and recenter this and set the next one to five. Go ahead and recenter that curve. And we'll bring up our animation timeline if we need to. That's A on the keyboard. We see we get an animation, but if I scrub along this animation, you can see the width of this texture is now being controlled by this curve, which we couldn't do before. Uh, this is this is really cool. If you put this into height, then it should change together. Um, not sure if it is. <laughs> is that working? I don't know if it is. We'll have to do some more experimenting to figure that out. Furthermore, though, if we go into our angle UV, this is pretty sweet. If we have uh, a look at this, we can rotate the texture. So if we start at zero and then take the next one up to 90, right here you can see that you can rotate the texture in an animation now, which is pretty cool. Also, we have uh, Shift U and V, which is going to move the texture. Diameter usually works for a uh, different type of mapping. If we were in cylinder mapping, there should be a diameter option. So lots of cool things we can control with the curve fade when it comes to image-based textures. Now, another thing we may wanna look at is procedural textures. So if we look at something like, I don't know, Wood Advanced, maybe I'll make a point here. Wood Advanced has quite a few properties associated with it. When I plug a curve fade in, <laughs> yeah, you can control pretty much every aspect of a procedural texture now with a curve fade node. Again, I'm not sure how many things you could control on a procedural in the past, but you sure as heck can control a lot of them now, pretty much all of them, which is wild. So this is actually a pretty big deal for anyone who does animation and has ever needed to or wanted to get more control over their material animations. Now let's take a look at a material graph node that used to be an experimental feature, but is no longer. Speaking of experimental features, you used to have to go to edit, then preferences, and in Keyshot 11, underneath the general tab, you would have to enable experimental features. In older versions of Keyshot, you had to edit the XML file to gain access to experimental features. Luxia now has just taken experimental features out of the software, 
and if something's not ready for prime time, they won't ship it. So before I grab the ray mask node, if I zoom out in the real time view, I have an IES light, I've got a box without a lid, and I've got a mirror here. And the reason I set all this up is to try my best to demonstrate what you can do with the ray mask node. In the material graph, I'll right click, go to utilities and ray mask. When we double click the ray mask node, we see a bunch of checkbox options. Apply to front of geometry, apply to back of geometry, visible to camera, visible in reflections, and visible in shadows and opacity. Now I actually want to plug this into my diffuse color and I'll choose the opacity socket because the way the ray mask node works is you're typically using it to hide stuff from the rays that we're casting into our scene and therefore essentially make them invisible. So let's test out the first option, apply to front of geometry. When we turn this off, we should see that the front of our box disappears. So any surfaces facing the camera, those go away. When we apply to back of geometry, any surfaces that are not facing the camera disappear. And the result, as we can see in our mirror, is those back two surfaces disappear. And that even works in reflected surfaces, which is pretty cool. If we turn off visible to camera, we will not see the box. But interestingly enough, we still see the box in reflections. If we want to turn off the box in the reflections, we turn off visible to reflections or in reflection. Now, oddly enough, it still casts a bit of a shadow, so we could turn off visible in shadows. And uh, <laughs> I guess that doesn't quite work here. Let's turn these back on, visible to camera and reflections, but turn on and off the visible in shadows. See how the box right now is not casting a shadow? If I turn that on, it is casting a shadow from our IES light. So we have the ability to control which parts of our scene are essentially going to be rendered, which is one step closer to being able to override the physics that Keyshot is known for and give you some art directability here as well. We also have a opacity slider, so we can basically just fade out the object on its own. Now I'm curious, I almost wonder if we could control something like this with the curve fade. Could we control the opacity? Uh-huh, we could. So now, instead of using a curve animation, a uh, fade animation, you could use this. I think this artifact we're getting is because the cube is basically on the ground, kind of intersecting. I wonder if I move it, that would go away. So snapping to ground doesn't help, but what if I move it off the ground in a tiny bit, like 0 0.001 feet? Sure enough, that seems to do it. Pretty cool. So now if I were to go back into that material, play with the curve fade, drag along here, we are fading our object in and out. That is pretty cool. All right, that's the ray mask, and hopefully you got some fun ideas of how you can use that. So there's a quick look at the ray mask in Keyshot 2023. Another very minor update, but one that could mean some quality of life for you is the ability to multi-select in certain lists, such as our camera lists. Before, if you had created a bunch of cameras, you couldn't multi-select them and quickly and easily delete them. Same with the duplicate button. This also works for environments and it works for image styles lists. Another update we have here in the color section, in addition to our Pantone library being updated, we have access to a new section, a new standard library of color called Coloro. As far as I understand, Coloro is basically just a competitor to Pantone. So it's just another massive color library that's uh, standardized. And um, yeah, maybe that'll be helpful to you, especially if you're you know, graphic or packaging designer or dealing with print or anything like that. That's Coloro feature support. In addition to the features I already shared, Keyshot 2023 also includes the following. Support for image formats like WebP, HEIC, HEIF, CR2, NEF, ORF, RW2, PEW, ARW. Support for AXF metadata in the CMF tool. The web viewer now supports rendered image attachments, AR and VR, and has a quality slider for lower powered devices. We have improved speed when searching in the scene tree improve speed when closing Keyshot or creating a new scene. We have keyboard shortcuts that allow us to select a group or model in the real-time view, updated RAL color system to 2022. We reduced the noise and glossy reflections in product mode that was introduced in Keyshot 11.3, as well as at least 120 bug fixes. To view a full list of features and bug fixes, be sure to check out the release notes linked up in the description below. And until next time, happy rendering.